Hello. Good evening again. And um, apologies if you've had some problems at the door and stuff. Um, now here to be entertained. I'm going to introduce Rob Young. Rob is going to pick up on um, some themes that were aired in um, our first panel discussion about sleep design and photography, um, principally the end of everything as it relates to music and the physical objects. Um, a panel that um, is co-hosted with The Wire. Rob Young is editor-at-large of The Wire. He's author, journalist, father of two. Um, he's author of um, a favour and favour publication, Electric Eden, Unearthing Britain's Visionary Music, a book which on publication one year ago? Was it one year ago, Rob? was, wasn't it? Became an instant classic. And um, <laughs> such an instant classic that I'd forgotten that it was published a year ago. And um, I just want to say something that Michael Bracewell said about the book, which is, Young has charted territory that is sodden with mystery and tunneled under with ceaselessly interconnecting themes and ideas. It is as much a state of consciousness that his book describes, connecting sunlit myths of merry England to a bewitchingly autumnal study of English music's profound relationship with time and the land. What beautifully written praise for an absolutely fabulous book. But we're not here to talk about Electric Eden, we're here to talk about collateral damage. So welcome Rob Young and his guests. Thank you, Lee. Um, uh, yes, we're, we're going to be quite a long way from Merry England tonight. Um, I'll just, uh, we're hoping sort of uh, running a bit late, I think, so I'm just going to keep the introductions quite brief. Um, starting on my right, uh, Pete Kember, also known uh, as Sonic Boom, uh, founded the uh, guitar band Spaceman 3 back in 1982. Um, released albums such as The Perfect Prescription and Playing With Fire, disbanded in 1991. And uh, he's pursued a career that's moved through projects like Spectrum, uh, EAR, which is Experimental Audio Research. And uh, I was just remembering that the last time I saw Van playing live was in a, a venue in Liverpool where I think the set was interrupted after about 10 minutes the fire alarms went off. So. Uh, <laughs> Two minutes even, but it was two wonderful minutes. And um, uh, more recently, uh, he's been acting as a producer for groups like MGMT, and he mixed and mastered Panda Bear's Tomboy album. And he's been working on uh, mastering Red Crayola reissues and uh, lots of stuff like that. And he's playing a show at the Electric Ballroom on the 1st of December. So that's Pete Kember. Uh, and a bear show. And a bear show, okay. And, uh, Justin Robertson, also on my right, uh, began as a DJ and producer in Manchester back in the early 90s, and then he formed the group Lion Rock, um, and he has produced a variety of electronic music and uh, in a variety of groups under lots and lots of different names, which we don't have to list now. Most recently, um, going out as the Deadstock 33s. Uh, and he's recorded on a, a whole bunch of uh, record labels from Deconstruction through to Tiger Sushi and Goma. He's even had a go at running his own label called Never Work. <laughs> he obviously never did. No. Um, <laughs> and uh, um, he's, he'll be hosting the Micron New Year's Eve party in Manchester um, this, at the end of this year. Uh, on my left, um, Bob Stanley. Um, he, of course, uh, is a writer, journalist, and founder member of Saint Etienne. Um, I actually remember swapping fanzines with him back in the late 80s when he was writing a fanzine called CAF and releasing flexi discs, a long, long forgotten medium. Uh, he's since been a writer for NME, Melody Maker, Mojo, The Times, The Guardian, and so on and so on. And um, with Saint Etienne, he's released seven LPs, I think it is, from Fox Base Alpha to the most recent Tales from Turnpike Lane. He's also a film producer, producing a string of films investigating kind of a, a hidden spirit of London. And I think it's fair to say that he has a large record collection. And finally, um, on, uh, also on my left, Claire Titley, 
uh, is the co-founder of the Upset the Rhythm label, and it's also a very active uh, promotions company. We're putting on a lot of underground um, gigs in London and beyond. Uh, and she's also um, with her partner in the label, Christopher Tipton. She is one half of uh, the group Way Through, um, which is a kind of a, a group which has been uh, sort of using music to explore aspects of uh, landscape, both urban and uh, rural, and um, putting out interesting projects involving uh, books and CDs and so on. Um, and their latest album has just come out called Arrow Shower. So, um, if you'd like to welcome the panel. Woo! Now, I mean, the idea of this panel really um, kind of spins off from um, a regular column we've been running in the Wire magazine uh, over most of this year. Uh, the column has been called Collateral Damage, and um, it's really been designed to try and explore what you could perhaps call the ethics of um, the digital revolution. In other words, we've kind of been inviting um, a variety of different commentators uh, to talk about the pros and cons of the whole business of file sharing and the digitization of music, the disappearance of music as a, as a sort of solid commodity. Um, you know, what is that doing? <clears throat> to music, what is it doing to the practice of music as an artist, what's it doing to the economy of music? These are all questions that are very much around in the air at the moment, but we've been sort of trying to get opinions from a lot of different perspectives. Um, and I really wanted to sort of uh, start by just dropping a few um, kind of vignettes into, into the discussion at the moment of stuff that's kind of happening at the moment that perhaps reflects some of the, some of the things that are going on. Um, for example, this week there's just been an announcement that Spotify, which is, you know, of course, the free streaming service, got you know thousands of uh, tracks available up there. But um, about 200, well, actually, one distributor of about 200 labels this week announced they are pulling their entire content from Spotify. Um, so we're sort of perhaps signalling the sense that free, free provided content like that is perhaps, uh, you know, being starting to be seen as a, you know, um, a hindrance, um, officially. Um, something completely different, there's been a, a YouTube clip that I think has been viewed by a, over a million people. I mean, a tiny fraction of the world's population, but quite a lot for YouTube, um, of uh, a Texan judge, a guy called uh, William Adams. Uh, and it's, a, I mean, it's an absolutely horrific piece of film. It's basically a, a hidden video camera in, in the bedroom of his teenage daughter and he's kind of giving her, you know, what kind of he describes as a thrashing. Uh, and that, that was in fact punishment uh, because she had been caught uh, downloading free content over the internet. Um, so, uh, <laughs> watch out. Um, really, uh, stay clear of Texas. Um, that, that's Texan justice. Um, and uh, also the, um, just, just a kind of anecdotal thing, really. We had a, a letter um, written to us at, at The Wire not so long ago by a musician called James Toft, who actually performs under the name Wooden Wand. Um, he was just uh, saying that recently he, I mean, he, he recorded an album a while ago, and he was asked to perform that album in full at a gig. And um, basically he couldn't remember how that music went, and he just recorded it off the cuff. So he, he went to a, da a, a downloading site to try and download a copy of his record to you know so you could sort of relearn the, the music and this this uh, file sharing site was run by somebody you know you, you had to sort of be registered with the site you had to be approved as a member in order to um to, to get this stuff and when he actually asked if he could you know he was refused so uh, and he sort of started a correspondence with the guy running the site and you know the guy said well no sorry you're not registered and, can't let you have it, you know. But I'm, I'm the artist, you know. I've recorded this stuff. Yeah, I don't care, man. I don't care, man. You know, it's, uh, <laughs> you can't have it. So, in a very strange sense, he was sort of locked out of his own music, you know. And, and the guy, guy making the stuff freely available, actually, was really not, 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 uh, not prepared to even surrender this free content to the artist who made it. So, um, I'd, I'd also just like to start by um, reading a very small passage from the first column that we ran in that series. 
um, which is written by a man called Kenny Goldsmith, who's an American, um, and he runs a, a download site called Ubu Web. Some of you might know it, and it's a massive online archive of sound art and sort of avant-garde film and music and uh, all sorts of other bits and pieces. I mean, some of it is and it's all freely available to watch and download. Um, and it's an amazing resource, uh, something that lots of people have made use of. But uh, Kenny wrote quite a provocative piece for us, and I'll just read you a paragraph from it. He said, it's all about quantity. Just like you, I'm drowning in my riches. I've got more music on my drives than I'll ever be able to listen to in the next 10 lifetimes. As a matter of fact, records that I've been craving for years there's a, I think there's the sense to me comes across from that particularly is there's the sense of actually the act of collecting somehow is sort of taking over from what's being collected and the um, old newspapers you think yes we've got a separate apartment for the collection um, unread <laughs> yeah it's a bit very compulsive about like, you know, collecting music I mean, when I, I moved from Manchester to London, and I, 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 got, I sold a lot of my records because I was conscious I didn't want to have a library of music, I wanted to have a collection of music I love. I didn't want to have every single thing on a label I wanted to have. I wanted to go through everything I built and love. Some people like the compulsion to, to collect and to amass stuff, whether they like it or not. So it's kind of, yeah, I, I, I think the current state allows you to do that much, much more readily. But, um, I guess people are always been around and people are always going to collect more than they can possibly enjoy. <laughs> I mean, a lot of the question seems to come down to, you know, are you, is it, it's obviously a good thing when that your music reaches the other people, um, but, you know, at what point does it become unacceptable that a lot of people are listening to it but not, not paying anything for it? I guess that's, that's quite often, at the, that's one of the nubs of this argument, I think, very often, you know, that, because when you start as an artist, you know, especially in music, you just want people to, just want it to get out there, don't you? But at some point, if you're serious about it, you know, you want to start earning something from it. I mean, Bob, have you got any thoughts about that? Um, well, I don't know if that's actually the case, because I think, you know, certainly until 10 years ago, you know, if, if you have had more and more people listen to music, you're going to make more and more money. So it doesn't actually occur to you, oh, I really need to make money. That was never an issue. Um, but um, I, don't know, I, don't, I don't think you can really expect people to have to pay to enjoy what you're doing. Because um, all, all of us, like, you know, we'd go around to a friend's house and have a record play team that I'd like it, he wouldn't like it. And you'd go out and buy a record by that person or you wouldn't. Um, so, I don't expect them to pay to listen to what I do necessarily. Um, obviously, at the same time, I'm, I'm aware that if people don't pay for what I'm doing, then I'm not going to make any money. Should they, pay, should they pay to own it, not to listen to what you do, but should they pay to own it, or should they have the right to own it anyway? But which seems to be a common. I think I'm owning music now is, is, is the issue, isn't it? Because I don't, I don't think anybody can say they own music. Because you don't own the music, you own a copy of the music that's your personal access to the music and the sleeve and the energy. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh, owning an artifact to make things different by the music. That's that's the that's the thing. Um, so the music should be free but the artifact I should be. Yeah, pretty much, yeah, yeah. I think you know, it, it, if, if you if you're putting out any kind of product now, it has to look like something people are gonna want to buy. It's a, that's a very uh, broad uh, statement to impose. I'm not imposing on the other Well, just saying that's what I think. That's how we do it. I think, I think if you want to give stuff away for free, great, people will appreciate it, and most people do do that. But to say that something you might spend one, two, ten years of your life doing, you just have the right to that and live for free. I, I certainly don't subscribe to that, and I'm not doing it for that. I expect to make, I expect to be able to pay my rent. Be able to go around Tesco's and you know, grab so some yeah, and cheese back. This feels like uh, that's the reality now. It's like having to work around that. I but, I, but I think all those things should be free. Why can't I? Why can't I get my wine and my cheese from my Tesco's? <laughs> As a musician who everyone has access to my stuff for 
free, surely that gives me some sort of right. And we all have the same right to choose what we have for free. <laughs> That's a good point. I mean, I think that um, one of the points, actually, another of our um, columnists wrote was, you know, maybe the analogy is a bit like if you, if you have a garden and, you know, you plant vegetables there one year and then people come at night and help themselves to your cabbages. How much longer? <laughs> How much longer are you going to carry on planting your cabbages? You know, are you going to bother next year? How could you afford to? How could you afford to put the time and effort into paying the people who are playing the records for everyone who actually went out of their way to make that thing what it is? And should they be doing it for them? Should they be what? How should they uh, live? I think we're talking about a physical thing. Though, like a cabbage is a physical thing. A cabbage is not like a, a piece of music that's in the air. You know. It's like but that's a very recent development. And his views has always been as has always been obviously. I suppose music has always been a product. Music has always been a, a it's always kind of straddled that high culture, low culture. And in the low culture sense it's not been thrown away, it's always been what people listen to that really. What's on the radio, what people take. Who decides what's high culture and low culture and music? That's interesting. No, but I mean, you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't, we wouldn't be having the same argument about literature, for example. We wouldn't be saying, no, nobody in their right mind would buy a book and expect to get the Kindle edition. But everybody expects to buy a vinyl record and download it. I think that'd be perfectly reasonable to buy the book and get the Kindle edition. Yeah, but it doesn't happen. It's exactly the same. It's it, is exactly, it is exactly the same, but it doesn't happen. Are we talking about, I mean, people say about music's always been, the music industry's really young, it's only been going there for like 30, 40 years. So maybe we're just going back to being like many troubadours and busking around, you know, like we're asking people to pay us to what they think is worth. <laughs> yeah. the, Ultimately, uh, that's the way it works. In a village, you pay money. We don't buy anything like that. So, yeah, just, I mean, people always talk about music and just like it's always been there. And um, um, to, 
in, in my in to me it's just like okay it, the only thing that really annoys me is if the stuff comes out before it's finished or I mean it has happened to us it's not finished product is got out there and that is just so I don't understand why you differentiate having stuff having you dirty. I think it's I the idea is the artist wants it. <coughs> I think it's that kind of intention thing. You want to make sure. then that's what that, that's for. Yeah. You want to give stuff away for free, but isn't it the artist's choice to say, Yeah. I would like to give this away for free or I'm gonna give this away six months before it's out. Yeah. Or what have you. Rather than someone else deciding around. For you, yeah. Bobby mentioned earlier on that this idea of sharing music, like you know, like listening around a, a mate's house or something like that, which is um, which is a way of looking at it. But I mean, isn't it isn't the difference now that um, uh, you know friends are now actually more than just people in your room; they're actually strangers out on something you know, that people share. Isn't, isn't that the difference maybe when we go to the sense of what a friend is online is all very different and potentially vast? Yeah, yeah, I suppose it is. I suppose in that, in that case, the thing that friends you playing a record to might go out and buy the record, you're still going to have um, just, you know. It's so quiet. Is it quiet? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, oh, speak up. Yeah. Oh, there are bloody <laughs> <laughs> Just like um, yeah, I suppose this gives you the opportunity to like play music for a lot more people who might go out and buy it. Well, I, I think, you know, I really think that people go out and buy a physical product is um, it's a niche thing now. It's like, you know, there's, there's no getting away from it. Um, if people want to download things officially off iTunes, or this thing's officially on Spotify and pay £10 a month. Um, the amount of money C and P you're going to make is negligible. You know, it's just nothing. It's so, would you, know, would, you, would you rather have the download or would you rather have a pound seven inch? Well, right. Of course, I'd much rather have people buy seven inch, but the reality is, that, I don't know, going to now. The, the, the difference is that you, you know what the enjoyment you can have out of that. Then I'm still, I'm still surprised as a promoter when I'm at the merch desk and someone's buying something and they say to the artist, I downloaded this, great. So I'm going to buy a shirt or I'm going to buy a collection of time. That's very generous of them, isn't it? I stole the same from you, so and now I'll, I'll buy um, something else. I, I'm yeah. amazed at how many times that happens. Because I'd never say that to someone. I'd be, I'd be like more People do. They say, well, I have it for free and I shouldn't have done that. So, um, I mean, and frankly, in most label setups, it is better um, for somebody to buy a shirt off, off the artist that they've bought themselves sure. and they're going to get 90% of revenue. Yeah. So, has it actually just made. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, the music business is turning into a guilty it, concert. It's made, most bands, <laughs> it's made most bands go out and play a lot more live. Make zero. Yeah, it's a lot more on t-shirts and actually people because they don't spend money on, on uh, records and the right to will actually go and go to a show. Well what's why well, why is yeah. that? I mean that's gonna because I mean we've seen we've seen the lines of what it's really good is good despite the kind of economic disaster that's happened in the UK and Europe and America. But Arsenal joined Arsenal make having to do more to cover their costs that are higher. But, um, we've, we've gone from records though in the 60s where yes. artists were given five or six cents a record and, and, and for decades it was laughed at as being the most disgusting, mistreatment of people. And it finally got up to a stage where people were getting a reasonable, not an unreasonable, a reasonable return for the work that yeah. they did. And to see that taken away so quickly and arrogantly by people who don't understand the economics is, no, I think, I very sad. And they don't realise what they, they will lose from that. It is awful, but I, we can't go back. We have to make something out of what happens. You know, we have to try and find new economies and new... I mean, the underground, particularly, to the experimental... I think education goes a long way. I mean, I, I don't think there was a record that came 
had throughout the 80s on vinyl. It didn't have a big logo on the inside sleeve saying don't take this thing. Did that stop you? No, it, well, me, no, I didn't take records. I maybe used to take the John Peel show, you know, so yeah. I could listen to it the next day. Sure, at a point, when it's worth listening to in the, the late 70s and early 80s, but um, if I like something, I went out of my way to buy it, and I still do now if I find something online. I'm not happy to just download it. Uh, you know, I, I feel I need to, to, to uh, maybe the money doesn't even get to the band, but uh, just the fact that someone put it out and made it available, I feel I should contribute to that. I agree, but I don't I think the genie's a little bit out of the bottle though, because I think if you, if you speak to anyone under the age of 18, they wouldn't have any, any concept of, of, of buying music. That's what I say, that's all about education, isn't it? It's like, but how do you go back and explain to a 16 year old that now what you used to get for free or for makes, you know, you have to pay for it's almost like, it's too late. You know, it's, we're, we're beyond that by several years. But the record is a digital, Justice Bill, as much as I kind of think that'd be great if we just started paying for music, it's kind of too late. It's, it, it's done. Too late to pay for music. It's too late to undo the technology, it's too late to undo the culture. It's been going on for years. It's, like, and it's, it's not, it's not strictly really true, actually, is it? Because the technology actually could be, it could be much more. I mean, they went out of their way with CDs and with that and stuff for a long time to make sure that they digitally copy stuff. Yeah. And there was a certain point where. Actually, the major record labels, Columbia, Sony, basically sold everyone, all the all the artists, Dan Wine, and the same with the iTunes deal they did. Yeah. Uh, it's a massively, massively reduced royalty and stuff. And they, they didn't care, they just care about volume and all the rest of it. And, yeah, of course, no surprises. But, uh, yeah. I mean, what, what's, what's this doing to actually sort of the way music is being made or, or, or might be made, you know, because I mean, I mean Peter, you already mentioned, you know, that when you make music, you know, you might have to sort of pay other musicians, for example, I mean, you know, there's certain ways of music that still, yeah. still require, <laughs> you know, still require going into a studio with all that entails, whereas, I mean, someone like yourself, Justin, um, uh, you know, Justin, you work in more sort of electronic production, you know, obviously that sort of, uh, much more compact and you can do it at home and I mean obviously, obviously there's been an enormous boom in that kind of production but you know there's a sense also that that starts to exclude certain certain ways of making music you know that, that, that you know certain options are now just not going to be considered I and mean, what's your take on that? Yeah I'm totally okay when it's kind of thinking that I, I, I don't know, I have absolutely no idea. I, I, just, <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I, just, I was hoping that someone would it's an answer because it, the interesting thing about the digital revolution, and it is a revolution, it, is that the, the the kind of opportunities and the democratisation of music and the production of music is fascinating. That people can go from making something in their bedroom to getting it out to everybody. I think that's fascinating, and I think it's taken it away from the kind of elite to the idea that you know you have to be a special person to make music. You have to be a special person. To Old to the music. I think that's exciting, but I can't play my phone. And that's the one thing. There's been people so, doing it for the love of it since I Moon Dog and yeah, exactly. you know, way before. But I, I, I don't know. I, I, I hope that it, in the best, my best scenario is that people will see a worth in what the musicians they love and the music they love and they will support them the way, the way they can. Whatever economy in t shirts. Well, who's going to just see the situation? I don't know anyone who's going to wear one of them. It's like you're like busking again. It is like busking. I know that sounds crazy, but. That's why I wear it. I mean, busking for you. They took the drums away. But yeah, I don't, I, I, I don't know. I hope in the, my, my best possible view is it's, it's opening the world of music to everyone and everyone here. It's going to be a sharing experience. And the worst possible scenario is it's just going to be the same old big names are going to make their money out of the people down over there. It's all fun. Well, that's <laughs> going to happen anyway, so that's the way the world works. Yeah. But, I mean, one thing I've noticed, just on a purely anecdotal level, is, is that people's way that people access music has changed and the way that they, they feel about different types of music has changed. Um, I think about the label like Sublime Frequency. Uh, 
done shows for um, uh, Victor Wayne and Omar Soliman. Omar Soliman, um, um, Syrian um, um, dance music, um, on the paper, uh, sort of music um, um, in, in practice, um, hundreds of stuff our kids are the same. And I don't think that would have happened ten years ago. I, I don't think that the, I think the sort of the way that we were able to access music to free music and access to different types of music. There are bad sides to that because it means that people listen to the tracks, they listen to one thing out of the artist's so and they go off and they make the they, they, I mean, that's the, that was the, uh, I, I enjoyed uh, Amanda Brown's um, piece um, who runs Not Not Fun recordings, and she had uh, an interesting comment about how you could. Um, Access and listen to uh, and it, an artist who had to for half an hour. You could skip to wherever you're going. It was in the past, you'd have to actually sit and read all the time. It's an old thing. It would be interesting. You know, it's really interesting. But I still think. You can skip is, through a record. <laughs> it is still. I still think that people are being exposed to more and different types of music. And, and that has to be a good thing, surely, for, for experimental musicians from the underground. For things out, um, you know, we're talking about anti elitism. We're saying that's only been there because of the digital download. I think it's made. I think it's made a big, a big impact because it, it has, um, it has just sort of. It's easier. It's easier to access. It's easier, but I disagree. Yeah, it's easier. I mean, that may be a bad thing for the musicians themselves, but it, it does, it does mean that different types of music are being listened to. And listen to more people. Um, people are making more um, um, connections with things and juxtaposing things more. And that's, that's just the, the experience I have with my peers and my friends and people that come to gigs. I'm always surprised at people that come to, they come to this show and they come to that show. And I'm like, oh, you can like that and that. And, and I'm convinced that it is this sharing and. It's, it's definitely much, much easier for kids. Like when I look at friends of mine, whose kids are 20, they might have, I don't know, whatever, two, three hundred albums on their computer. Yeah. They might not listen to most of them that well. They might have grabbed them for whatever reason here or there. But when I was 20, I was probably exceptional in my age group having like a hundred. Yeah, yeah. That would no. be like a, a big deal back then. So to have yeah, hundreds. So. But then that's then that's going to be more the cultural shift. Don't you think there's a lot less um, in emotional investment, investment in general, emotional, financial, and um, going out and buying a record and taking something through? Don't you think if you, I don't know, I used to go out when I was a kid and had my you know, two shillings taking the road to buy. <laughs> <laughs> LSD. Trying to hold this To buy, you know, a record that week, and I'd have to make a judgment on the sleeve and whether the record in the shop would let me listen to more than one track off of it. And I'd have to sort of, you'd have to sort of, I don't know, there was a certain investment in something, and it made you either really, um, I think it made you check it out properly, and whether you, you end up liking it or not. That still, that still happens. That, that obsession about the object still happens. I mean, that's why there is the revival of tapes, why tapes are like the new whatever. And so I'm is this a good thing? I'm not sure it's a good thing, but it's an interesting thing. I remember going to, um, um, what was the, the noise festival in New York? No, it's not that fun. No, it's fun. We went like six years ago to No Fun. And they had Hanson tapes selling their noise tapes in the, in, the, in the sort of garage space outside. And there was a queue of like 30 teenagers like fighting each other. I want the one that's number one, I want the one that's number two. And it was just like, oh, okay, it's a cassette tape. Oh. Do we have a cassette player? Is that more a collecting thing though? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. So there's definitely a revival of interest in old formats. Yeah, but yeah, it's not quite the same thing. I think what Pete was saying is, like, I remember like buying, you know, like, I had a 
job selling cheese and bacon on the market store on a Saturday, and I could afford one album a week. I remember buying the first Killing Joke album and playing it several times. No, I didn't see that at all. Sometimes I play it over and over trying to convince myself I like to make money on it, um, and that, that's that's the investment of time and emotion. No, I do think you're right. I think that people are more likely because I have a completely ambivalent relationship to. Um, people are more likely to make snap judgments. And I think the kind of the, the blog culture that has come out of this um, technology accelerates that. It is like this track, 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 like buy an album for iTunes, you might sit and like, well, I've got a few things myself, I'm going to get that, or, or, and, um, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll get back to that, I'll get back to that, whereas, you know, and so I think a lot of things you can do, you'll know by now I'm ready to the, you know, how I hate that album, let's go, you know, I think in some ways you, you, you can buy things and give yourself more time to, to listen, I'm not sure, you know, I, I, mean, I, I think I, there's so much, you know, we can talk about this in like in absolute, like people, oh, people download and then never buy. But then I did a little bit of rubbish market research for this, and I sort of started asking people. I asked people to show a show last night, and I worked with, and I said, "What do you do?" And like the weird thing for me that I didn't expect was the consensus was, "Oh, I'll listen to some tracks online, and then if I like it, I'll buy a record." I think we could uh, talk about this a lot longer, but people are throwing shapes at me over there. So um, we are uh, we're going to have to call it a day there. Um, but uh, um, just uh, yeah, I think that was a really interesting discussion, and I think uh, what I'm left with really is the thought of um, you know is the logical extension of that idea of you know uh, this sort of new culture having. You know, takes it beyond sort of the, the elite in terms of accessibility, but is the logical outcome of that that music making becomes a hobby you know, rather than a profession? And that's that. I think that's perhaps what we're standing on the edge of at the moment. I don't know. I'm not sure any of us exactly know that. I think we're in a sort of transitional stage right now. You know, I think we will probably feel. So we don't really have a conclusion. I said we're walking that. <laughs> I would say the way the conclusion is that even though people will or won't pay for music, we will go to the live shows and yeah. I know from the Panda Bear record I did, yeah. from playing seven shows with him and the whole crew, the big live show, I made more money from seven shows than I made from working for a month on the album, yeah. doing special edition, the whole bit. Yeah. I mean, as, as somebody who works on live shows and as a label and as a musician, I would just say, for me, the sort of running course is just to get people to go out to shows to like to, to, to it's kind of cool it's a bigger thing if people go out to live shows it's kind of cool in a way it has a different rejuvenating thing on yeah, them they don't have to sit at home and, and, and get their royalties anyway they kind of have to work for it a bit more there's something maybe to be that's going to hurt right. in mitigation to everything else so. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay um, thanks very much Claire Bob Justin and Pete Woo! Thanks very much.